Hello, 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 and welcome to PD Reimagined. I can't believe we are nearing the end of our pilot with you guys. Um, I wanted to, before we uh, really kick it off tonight, uh, acknowledge the elephant in the room, obviously, in a time uh, that we should all be super happy and celebrating with graduations, with um, vacations looming and all the hard work that you guys have done this last um, year uh, that you should be celebrating. And if, instead, we're sort of mad with the incredibly sad news um, of what happened with the mass shooting at Rob Elementary. So um, nobody obviously should go through anything like that. So I just wanted to take a minute before we even get started just to um, to pay respects and uh, think about all the people who who may have lost their lives or been injured or been affected by this uh, in some way. So, and, and thank you all for your te uh, as teachers, as educators for, for showing up every day, even when this is a potential risk. So um, I just want to take a minute uh, for that. Thank you. Um, I really it is just it's always terrifying when I hear things like that as a as a parent, obviously, and I'm sure you guys feel it as teachers. So uh, I do really, really thank you again for the heroes that you all are every day. Um, moving on, though, I wanted to um, next last week, a uh, last week, gosh, it's been so long last month, actually, we talked about leadership with Antonio Viragosa. Um, I hope we all had a chance to see that either live or as a recording. We talked about what it means to be a leader, why relationships are so important, how to lead when things get chaotic, and how to deal with uh, criticism, opposition, and why uh, a growth mindset can be a superpower. Uh, this month, we're going to be talking uh, about multitasking and stress management and the reality of what it really means to strive for that work-life balance. So uh, what this really means is, uh, you know, what, is it, what does it mean to multitask? How do you stay calm, even when you have this growing list of uh, things to do, uh, so that you don't feel that massive pang of anxiety that hijacks your metacognitive function? Uh, the power of imperfect action, the practical sort of strategies for work-life balance, uh, those of you, you should have all received your care packages. In those care packages, we did have a brochure. Um, and I did talk about what actually happens in our brains. And I used my own example of losing my dog as, um, uh, as a moment where I personally felt grief in the last few weeks. Um, and what happens to our brain when those big emotions come in. So that's going to be relevant today too and whether it's you know with the mass shooting and things those types of um events or whether it's uh just a lot on our plates there's a lot of reasons why people feel burnout there's a lot of reasons why we start to feel overwhelmed so before i go any further i wanted to do two quick polls with you guys and just hear from you um first and foremost how many and andy can you do the multitasking poll please do you consider yourself a multitasker? Um, so yes or no? As a teacher, I think I understand <laughs> yes, that 100% of you have said yes. <laughs> um, we can um, uh, end that poll and share it. Um, and then um, the second one is uh, what overwhelms you uh, the most? So can we show that one too, please? What, when tasks, become overwhelming. So what overwhelms you the most? Is it too many tasks and too little time? Too many distractions? The difficulty or challenge of tasks? Too many restrictions on how to complete tasks? In other words, bureaucracy. Uh, tasks that induce big emotions in yourself and others. So when others come in with big feelings or when you have those. When physical safety is threatened. And then choice seven is actually supposed to be other. <laughs> so for whoever um, put uh choice seven so there's a, a couple of you guys um if you can uh in the comments maybe 
if you feel comfortable sharing what that other is, it's always helpful for us to know the types of things that do become overwhelming. Um, all right, let's share those results. So we had 50% of you said too many tasks and too little time, 17% um, too many restrictions on how to complete the tasks, and then 33% um, other. So I'm um, interested to hear more about what that was. So great. Um, one second, let me move that. All right. So as always, I've shared a quote here. This is from Steve Jobs, uh, one of my favorites. Uh, People think focus means saying yes to the thing you've got to focus on, but that's not what it means at all. It means saying no to the hundred other good ideas that there are. You have to pick carefully. I'm actually as proud of the things we haven't done as the things I have done. Innovation is saying no to 1,000 things. Steve Jobs. Later, there was this, uh, just a while ago, actually, about a year ago, Inc. Magazine had an article that uh, talked about the key to better focus based on that particular quote, which I liked a lot. And um, it said uh, to give up on multitasking, uh, say no to cluttering your mind, say no to interruptions, say no to time robbers, and yes to time locking, say no to your own unbelief. So one of the things that I wanted to mention is that uh, it was it was something I was repeating something that was actually in your handouts, which is true multitasking um, doesn't really exist. And the reason is that physiologically we have a hippo, the hippocampus of our brain, right, that controls the intake and output of information. So it's your memory and recall um, and, and intake. Sorry, uh, that can only inhabit one thing at a time. So. It can, it does have a waiting room and you can go back and forth and back and forth between tasks, but true multitasking of having two, th doing two things um, doesn't exist. It's only uh, once you've automated certain things. So obviously you can um, uh, breathe and talk, you can, you can read and eat, um, and you can sometimes even drive and, uh, and talk or drive and sing or do something completely different that's also metacognitive. Uh, it's only when you can no longer be automated in that response. So in other words, when something goes wrong, so you swallow wrong and you start to choke or somebody cuts you off in the traffic and then you start to pay attention again. But that's why how the hippocampus works. And so when you have big feelings, for example, like I had with my with my the loss of my dog, when it was just utter grief, there was absolutely no way that anything else could go into the hippocampus of my brain because it was completely hijacked by that those emotions. So it took a while to process. That's why we have to go through and process those emotions first. And then after that, uh, we can get on with the other tasks that we have. But I just wanted to mention that. And I wanted to thank you all again. Uh, you guys are the founding participants in our pilot, so in this program. Uh, we I always love to get your feedback and hear what you have to say, and uh, we definitely want your help as we scale. So we want to know from you what's most valuable, what could we improve, who else might be interested in the program and things like that. So we will be asking you guys for um, some feedback as an exit uh, interview for as many of you that can can give that time to us. Uh, we can be super flexible and work around your schedules, but we really, really appreciate anything that you have to say. So thank you. This is the same as always, what to expect, same exact format. We're going to have our special guest in a minute. You'll, um, I'll stop talking. It'll be more questioning. Um, and then we are going to explore what themes we talked about. Uh, you guys can have some Q&A if there's any questions. Uh, feel free to also put your hand up if you have any questions. Uh, and then we're going to go uh, maybe collectively. It depends on how many people are here today. Uh, we can either go into breakouts or we can speak as a group and talk about uh, any big aha moments that, that you had and then come up collectively with uh, some strategies that are helpful for you, um, to, for you specifically, not for your students, but for how you can apply this to your own life to refuel and recharge you. So without further ado, let's guess the guest. Uh, the box obviously didn't have a whole lot of clues. It was more theme based, but in the box was a hat that was um, donated by this particular guest. So huge uh, thank you for that. Um, other clues are 
based in New York. They, are, uh, they have a very impressive career uh, stemming from marketing and media. And they've actually influenced so many different uh, ways in which we consume all sorts of different uh, forms of media, including music, radio, and streaming service. They're considered a pioneer in the industry and they're catering to the next generation. So can we have the poll on guess the guest, please? All right, who do you think the special guest speaker is? We have Maria Weaver, who's the president of WMX Warner Music Group, Laura Henderson, S uh, Senior Vice President at BuzzFeed, Sarah Blakely, founder and CEO Spanx, Greg um, uh, Joswiak, sorry, I can never say the last name, uh, Senior Vice President Worldwide Marketing Apple, and Raja Rajamana, uh, Chief Marketing Officer at MasterCard. All right. How's it trickling in? All right. All right, so we have, okay. We can end that. Um, yep. Yeah. So we've got 38% uh, of you thought Sarah Blakely. Um, we've got 25% of you each thinking it was Maria Weaver and Laura Henderson and 13% um, thinking it's Raja. So without further ado, let me share. Sorry, I'm just going to move this out of the way because it's a giant screen and uh, there you go. Without further ado, let me welcome Maria Weaver, president at WMX of uh, Warner Music Group. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, you've been involved with a lot of huge Fortune 500 companies, including Comcast. We've got uh, media companies, HBO, Showtime, Interactive One, and there are not many people who have as many things as you on your plate. So there's a lot of balls in the air for you in your current job as president of WMX. Um, including fan and artist experiences, streaming account, man uh, streaming account management and playlisting, direct to fan and merchandising operations, consumer um, acquisition, uh, content creation, business and legal affairs and finance, and not to mention all the other things that you are doing. So who better than you, Maria, to, um, to uh, tell us about how you do it? How, how do you do it all? And <laughs> welcome to PDR. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's such an honor to be here with all of you. Um, wow. Um, as I was listening to your description of uh, the theme for the night, I was thinking, um, I, I still feel every day like I'm trying to figure it out. So I certainly don't feel like an expert in uh, in um, time management or juggling it all. I, I will say, um, you know, so so I'm at Warner Music Group, but I work on the areas outside of making the music. So everything outside of making the music falls into my into my area. And and when you put all of those balls as that like illustration, it actually is pretty daunting. So I so the first thing I try not to do is I try not to think about how big the job is. Um, I, you know, I do think when you look at a task and, and think about how monumental it is, it, it makes it more daunting than if you think about the task at hand and focus just on that, right? And all of those are the things you're going to get to them. Um, I know a lot of people have different ways of, of using lists. Lists work for me sometimes. Sometimes I overlist myself. It's, you know, so I go back and forth as to whether or not lists work for me um, in a given situation. But the one thing I will say that you that you touched upon in the Steve Jobs quote um, is that I that I say no a lot, actually. Um, I I actually do. Um, you know, there, the, you know, there's a, an event, which is how I, I know um, Nadine it, it coming up in June um, that I normally would love to go to, um, but I've been traveling so much and I just had to say, no, I, I can't be there. And so I do think being able to prioritize based upon what's going on in your life. You know, I have two children. So, you know, between my children now back from college, work and travel, and all of those tasks at work, um, I, I do. I, the, the, I always say the word no is my friend. Um, I embrace the word no, and so um, that that's super helpful in my my day to day. 
Yeah, I think teachers sometimes feel like they can't say no to certain things because mm -hmm. there's a lot of obligation. There's just, you know, you're, you're working. It's not, it's not even just a job. It's actually a moral obligation as well. Right. And so I think especially, especially with the pandemic that you've seen a lot of people, teachers go so far and beyond their, their normal jobs with like now they've become counselors, now they've become, you know, all these other things are coming add to the fore. I think it's very difficult when you see a need to then say no. I think where it becomes something that is similar to a no in that situation is to not expect yourself to do everything perfectly. I think I think that's that's the pressure that we put on ourselves of you know and and the, the I'll just it's a silly analogy but I'm just it gives you a physical analogy. When you have a giant pile of stuff in your in your room in your office, right, and you have to clean up a little bit, it's overwhelming at first because there's so much stuff everywhere you can't even see where to start. But once you just say, "Okay, I'm going to take a, I'm going to take bits bits and pieces. It doesn't have to be the end. It won't be the perfect thing. I'm going to take my first handful, and then I can see again what needs to happen next and what needs to happen next." And I think as a teacher, you can do that because when people come to you, you can only give so much and you have to give yourself a break when you can't fix everything or when you, you, you cannot solve everything. Um, I think, you know, before we are teachers, we're human beings and we have needs. And I think when we say no to things, um, we've got to be really careful how we say no to a boss, for example. But I do think even in that situation, it's okay to have boundaries. Um, Brene Brown, I don't know what you think of this, um, Maria, but Brene Brown talks about asking what done means, unwrap done for me. So when a boss says to you, I need to do this and this and this, say, well, just unwrap that for me. I need to understand what you mean by that. Mm -hmm. And then and then be able to explain, look, here's what I've got on my plate right now. How would you like me to prioritize? Because, because I think that's not, it's a more polite way to a boss than saying no specifically, but saying it's, it's sort of acknowledging the fact that we're only human. And how would you like me to prioritize? Like, here are the things that I've got to do. What would you like me? How would you like me to prioritize? So I thought that was kind of a helpful thing, but tell me a little bit about your story. Cause I think, um, it's a very cool story. So you've got a, um, a very famous grandfather, a very <laughs> cool background. Um, uh, uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about Frederick Douglass and being related to such a legacy? Sure. Um, so he is my great, great grandfather. Um, I, I, I said Frederick Douglass, by the way, for those yes, who didn't you did say Frederick Douglass. Um, he is my great, great grandfather. And, um, you know, I think as a, as a young person, um, uh, uh, it, there definitely felt like a, like a level of pressure for sure. And, and, and probably some of it was just self-inflicted, but some of it was just, you know, every year I had to do a book report on Frederick Douglass, God bless you teachers. And I, and I appreciate that because it helped me learn about him. And then, um, I, I probably would not have, uh, taken it upon myself to do that. Um, but, you know, it definitely, I think, is the foundation of, of, of who I am and how I grew up. And, and, my, and, and my, my father is, um, was his great grandson. And so, you know, my father grew up knowing my father was a lot older than my mom. Um, and and um, were he alive today, he'd, he'd be pretty old. So there's there's that gap. But because of that, he, you know, he grew up in a household with a mother who knew Frederick Douglass and, and which is just like a little bit of a, like a bizarre thing. Um, the, one of the first things my dad did was put me in acting school when I was set, six or seven years old. I don't know if we talked about this before Nadine or not, but the whole purpose of why he was putting me in acting school at that time was for me to learn how to be an orator and for me to learn how to speak publicly. Um, and because he wanted me to become a lawyer, um, I ultimately fell in love with acting. So I went down a whole acting track, which was not his plan at all for me, <laughs> um, at all. But, um, but, you know, 
what I what I will say um, is that it, in my life now, it, I mean, it's it it gave me such a, an amazing foundation. And so, um, my eldest daughter, who's now twenty one, was very very shy, like really incredibly shy, did not speak in, in classes at all. And so when she was about 10 years old, I put her in an acting class and the improv really, the improv lessons and so forth really like broke her shell. Um, so anyway, I just, that's like antidote, but it, it, it stays with me because I do think it, it really helps young people find ways to express themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so about that though, it's actually on theme too, because again, it's that imperfect action, right? Yeah. That's what improv is. Improv is just yes and. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And it's just being comfortable, like uh, you know, they throw something at you and you have to be able to respond and in that moment. And um, you know, uh there's a you know, a, a, you know, a lot of people believe like you either need to be an expert. Um, in things or you fake it till you make it. Well, improv to me is like fake it till you make it kind of moment. Um, but anyway, I, um, I, from that experience is how I decided I wanted to be in television and in film, um, my love of, of the theater. But I, but I decided once I was already in college, I, I went to performing arts high school. I went to performing arts junior high school, then performing arts high school. Some, some people know of it as the fame school um, from back then. Um, and, but I then decided I wanted to be more behind the camera than in front of the camera, which is how I ended up switching my major to marketing and pursuing that track. Um, and so my career started at, at a company called Rainbow Advertising, which was a di division of a TV, um, channel. And, um, I, didn't you, you co-found that? Were you one of the co-founders? No, or? I co-founded a company called Triple Threat Films. Right. That's right. Um, which was a little bit later. So I worked at, 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 uh, at um, Rainbow and then at Showtime and then at HBO. And I was, um, I, it was after my second daughter, I was at a lunch meeting um, where we were discussing an upcoming show and my like you know this is when the cell phones were like big huge bricks um and the the woman who was helping me with my children um had basically my you know had a six month old and a two-year-old and she's at the doctor's office and she was trying to navigate it and like i'm on like it was just craziness and so i left hbo and i left my uh my career which was a very thriving on the rise kind of career but I, I, it was just, I was overwhelmed and you and Nadine, you and I were just talking, I was completely overwhelmed by it. There, this is before laptops. You couldn't really take your work home. Like it really was a big separation and I was working around the clock. Um, and so during that transition, I became a stay at home mom and created um, a film company um, called Triple Threat Films. That's so cool. I was a founder of that. Um, and then when I decided to go back, when my youngest was, in kindergarten is when I said, okay, now there's, you know, I, I, I think I've navigated my career by deciding, and I feel really fortunate that I've been able to say, um, this is where I am in my life at this moment and how to, and so even, even if, even when I went back to work, I, I chose a, a company interactive one, which was a startup, but wasn't going to require a lot of travel. It was going to require some hours, but it wasn't going to require a lot of travel. Um, and, and that was really important to me because even though they were five and seven, they still were young and I still wanted to be around as much as possible. And, you know, as president of the PTA and wanted to be involved in the school and wanted to do all of those things. Um, and, and as I moved through my career, I then chose as they grew up, I chose other kind of roles that were more expansive that might require, um, me to kind of move around more. Um, but in all cases, I, you know, so I went to Interactive One, was there for a while, and then Comcast, and now I'm at Warner Music Group. Um, but, you know, in each of those journeys, as they got older, I would have sit down and we would have conversations about what this next opportunity would be. Because when I first went back to work, um, they used to like say, they used to, they used to think of it as a project, because, you know, they were like, mom, is this project over yet? Like, when's this project gonna be done? I was like, no, it's a job. I have to go to, it's not, it's not a project. I have to go into an office. Um, so it's been an interesting 
journey. Um, one that, you know, I, I didn't write down on paper and, and, and map it out. Um, I, I think I've just allowed myself the flexibility to explore and pursue opportunities as they presented themselves and be open-minded to them and not feel, you know, a lot of people say, you know, how did you end up in the music industry? And, and I didn't really say, oh, I want to go be in the music industry. I, you know, um, I, I knew that there was something I wanted to do to help these music artists in mm -hmm. a way outside of their music, um, because so many of them mismanage their money and, you know, you know, we know those stories and those stories are very real. And if I could play a part in a positive, have a positive impact on these artists lives. And that was why I pursued this particular role. That's great. I mean, you touch on a couple things. One of the things that I, that I'm hearing is, um, you know, it takes, I think a tremendous amount of, um, I'm going to call it emotional intelligence, but it's actually sort of the self-management or self-regulation, self-management skills, right? So social and emotional skills that it takes to kind of, A, make responsible decisions of, of what's right for you right now and to have be brave enough to walk away from something at a time when it's thriving um, and reconfigure for yourself what success looks like in that moment and know that it's not forever. Because I think that's the other thing. I think, you know, gone are the days where somebody, um, where one decision is something that you have to, that you're stuck with forever. Cause I think that you can make a decision and it's a journey. It's not a destination. Um, but do you think, I mean, would you agree that those sort of skills of self-regulation and self-management skills are pretty high in terms of like something that you have to have. And if you're, if you're navigating yeah, those more and self-awareness, I mean, yeah. I think, I, I definitely think that that has been, um really important in helping me navigate just you know environments that may have felt toxic you know work environments you know I, I am uh throughout my career almost always the only person of color in the senior team mm -hmm. um and you know and 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 sometimes the only woman but oftentimes there's at least another woman um and you know some of those environments have been amazing and and encouraging and supportive and and great and they and, you know you can really thrive and then some of them have been have been fairly toxic, mm -hmm. um, and so I think that self awareness of like is this an environment I can really flourish in? Um, do I need to think about a different environment that that is going to be better for me where I can feel supported? And back to your point about saying no, where I can where I can say to someone. You know, I really want to do this thing, whatever it is, it's being asked of me, but I have an obligation with my kids tonight, right? Like that push pull, or I have a family, it doesn't even have to be kids, right? Like maybe you don't have kids, but you have other just family or obligations that, um, that you want to um, participate in. It's really hard. I, um, I had a boss at Interactive One, um, and that was, as I mentioned, the job I went to after I had been at home. And he was so awesome. He prioritized his boys' lacrosse games like I had never seen a man do before. He would leave. I mean, he would practically, you could be in mid-sentence and he'd say, I'm going to be stuck in traffic. I got to go. I'm going to be stuck in traffic. I got to get to the game. I got to get to the game. Like It was so important to him to do that. And so when it came time for me, when, you know, my kids started playing high school, or I guess maybe it was middle school sports, whatever it was, it was easier for me to have that conversation with him because he had always prioritized it for himself. And so I think just being, you know, aware of who are the kind of people you can work with and work for, and it just, it, it made such a difference for me in that moment. Um, because I had a boss and, and the fact that he was a man and understood that I might want to go and prioritize something before my children. Um, I think oftentimes people think that doesn't happen, you know, they say, oh, he'll never, under and that wasn't the case at all. And so I think dads feel pulled and torn too. And we, um, we underestimate that sometimes. I love that because it's sort of humanizing an occupation. So you're, you're in a work and a professional relationship with someone, but you're humanize they're humanizing it with like these other priorities that you have, you're decloaking, so to speak, the, the from this occupation sort of role to, oh, now, but I'm actually this human being with these other things. And 
I mean, for me, I remember I was much younger when I was um, a lawyer, but I do remember a boss who didn't think that I should be able to have a life. And I felt very little ability to say no, but it all came to a head when they said that I had to move to another city because I didn't have a life because I would always say yes to everything. And my only reply that I could think of at the time was, I have a gym membership. And <laughs> it was like the only thing I could think of. But um, but I was in my, my 20s then, but it was just one of those things where I definitely felt really disempowered. And I, you know, I knew it wasn't right, but, um, but it happens a lot. And I think yeah. you do. The nice thing uh, for teachers right now, I think, is that there is a, a, a tremendous amount of demand for teachers. So you can actually pick and choose a little bit the culture that you want to be in. And we talked about leadership last um, last month and, and what it means that we can either be um, influenced by energy or we can influence it. So I do think we can also um, be culture shifters in, in current um, settings as well. So if you are finding yourself in a somewhat toxic um, uh, culture, there are things that you can do to sort of shift things, um, even from the middle, not necessarily from the top. So, um, but that's very interesting. I, one of the things also about culture that, uh, you know, when you have a supportive culture or you know, a culture that sees you as a human being, a well-rounded human being, not just an occupation, um, is that uh, you're more free then to use your metacognitive functions for other things. So you're not scared, right, uh, of, of losing your job. You're not anxious about certain other things, all these sort of big emotions that come in and hijack your brain. Um, one of the things that I laughed about earlier, Maria, was these teachers in particular, um, I think you get these sort of caricatures, you well not caricatures, but like either teachers are often um, described by their occupation, they are teachers. And so you people forget that they're human beings and, uh, and everything's supposed to be G rated often, right. And so, um, whereas I think most most teachers I know have a hilarious sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I think it's it can be very disempowering when it's constantly um, your occupation first. So I think finding ways within your school where you can be the human being first and finding ways to bring that in is, I, I think, a fantastic thing. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so do you ever feel overwhelmed or stressed when you start your day and you look at all those things that need to get done? Um, I think my moment of feeling overwhelmed is generally around four o'clock. It's mm -hmm. actually not when I start my day. It's when, oh my gosh, I didn't get through as many of the tasks I want to get through and how many more hours and, oh, I just really want to go to bed early tonight or, oh, I just wanted that glass of wine and watch a movie and shoot, I'm not going to be able to do that. That's usually my moment. It's usually when I see how many more things I have to go. Um, it's, uh. And then I just have to like, just, you know, it's just kind of take that, take, take that, take that moment. Um, sometimes it helps me reprioritize. I'm like, okay, well, I didn't get it all done. So what, what are the key things I need to try to finish today, which is actually not a bad thing to take a moment. And then we, we kind of reprioritize because or else I was just kind of going through the whole day. Um, and then also just in, in, in as, as I'm sure happens um, for teachers, especially, um, things come up in the day that you just weren't expecting. And so you can't get to everything because you thought you had your day planned and the day doesn't go as planned because something else came up or something, you know, you, get, you know, you're putting out a fire. Um, it's so that time is generally my, my, my time of day that gets a little bit, um, a little bit tricky. But like I said, I then just usually take a look and try to rethink how can I reorganize or rethink about the rest of my day so that um so that i don't go to bed anxious about it right like it's um uh it's being able to give yourself permission like you said early on right to not not to not be perfect mm -hmm. to not feel like you have to accomplish everything but you know we're 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 driven um i think we're all driven right to to deliver on what we what we what we agreed to so you know in these cases i'm sure it's like if you have a test you, you agreed to give everybody back their tests the next day 
you're going to stay up all night trying to grade those tests because even though all those things happen and you didn't get to grade half the test in the day, like it's, it, it's hard. I think it's, it's hard to stop yourself from uh, not trying to complete all of the tasks. Um, Driven by competence. I think that like, yeah, I, and, I and just want to feel competent and work ethic and work ethic and just commitment. And, you know, I, I one of the things you know, I always worried when I went back to work about my children's perception of, uh, you know, whether or not I was giving them enough time or, you know, work-life balance to all those things that we've talked about. And I don't remember, my daughter was probably in high school and, and she was like just staying up like really late. Like, and I, and I said, I said, you know, you have to, you're going to have to like get some rest and she said, mom, I got my commitment and I went, my work ethic from you. Like I saw you, you're committed. You have a strong work ethic. She's like, I, I can't change that now. Like I've been watching you all these years. And so you realize like how that, and, and that I think goes for all of us, right? Like we know that we're modeling certain behavior that we want our children or our students or whatever to kind of model as well. And so you, you need to show up and, and do that and, it's, it's, you know, it can be overwhelming, right? You have to um, give yourself permission to um, take a step back. I, but I'm a, I'm a meditator and, and, and I have been for, before I became a fad, um, I started meditating. I was probably 22 years old when I was first introduced to meditation. Um, and, uh, and there are certain like, you know, apps that I'll, you know, look at or read or, you know, just take like, it just allows me to like, think about um, how, how not to be overwhelmed in that moment. So I, mm -hmm. I do utilize a lot of, a lot of tools, as they would say, yeah. to try to just, you know, not, not let it make me crazy. And that, and that also just comes, I think, with age. And I was just going to ask you that, do you think right? that, has there been an evolution in for you? Sure. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Um, I mean, I would definitely, you know, I didn't know, you know, I didn't always say no. I used to work around the clock. I mean, I definitely was a, 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 an extreme, you know, workaholic, just felt like I didn't have permission to, to do otherwise. Um, mm -hmm. And so I do think as you get older, you, you learn um, how to navigate that a little bit more. It is, it is funny, though. I think everybody is so different. I, I had to laugh when I spoke to my parents about their reactions to certain things because they would, uh, my brother who was on the more relaxed side, on the more calm side, um, they'd have to like constantly rev him up to like scare him into doing work and into doing stuff. And then to me, it was always like, then you're working too hard. Like, I was like, so unfair. Like, how about like, like this is it's so different. And uh, it's because it, I think every person needs different things. And for me, I'm that type A personality that needs to go, 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 that I'm constantly trying to remind myself, like, slow down. Like, it's okay. You don't need to do it all. You don't need to heal the world overnight. It's not going to happen. <laughs> like, um, you know, so it is, it is interesting how different approaches, you know, and I'm seeing it even with my own kids. So... <laughs> Um, uh, so it sort of touches a little bit, and we talked about it earlier, this concept of, uh, work-life balance. Does it exist for you? I think it exists. Um, so I, so I, I, I think I have what I, what I call, um, uh, work-life integration, um, more so than work-life balance. Um, you know, I also work, and, and maybe this goes back to your point about um, teachers, right? Like your your career and your profession is so much a part of who you are and how people describe you. Um, I happen to work in a career and in an industry that um, my children want to be a part of, right? Or that, you know, I, you know, I when I was doing the TV and film, I'm watching TV at night. So, okay, I'm gonna watch this documentary versus that documentary. It's just, I've been able to, um, it, it doesn't, my, my job doesn't feel like a job, I guess, is that that's really kind of the point, right? Like in, 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 in I'm, I'm passionate about the work that I'm doing and a lot of it would be, things that I would want to do anyway, right? There would be the music I want to listen to or it's the TV shows I want to, um, I want to watch. What I am really good 
at though is turn is is like turning it off like turning off my phone and going for a good hike like on a saturday um and um just trying to it's important for me to clear my mind um so i enjoy running i'm a runner i put my music on like i am good at like just like shutting it down my favorite thing on the iphone now is that you i have uh i keep my phone on on in work mode which means it doesn't buzz, it doesn't do anything. The only two people, three people that um, I've given a, I guess you can get an exception for my two kids and my mom, right? But like, it just keeps it from like always being a thing that I like, oh, someone text, oh, I need to read it, right? And so uh, that that work function on the phone has been a game changer for me. Uh, But I, you know, I think I don't know. I think work-life balance is, uh, it's just, I don't know. It's an overused <laughs> term. Um, I always, I, I personally, I think I find, I have a hard time believing that anyone truly has full work-life balance just because I think that there is always going to be a moment where you feel guilty about doing one thing or you feel like you're not doing enough somewhere else. And it's just, it's, I think it's just, there are moments and it comes in waves. And then there's gonna be moments where you feel like you got it all under control and you feel great. Um, But I I think that life is a moving target. And I feel like um, this concept of real balance is like a static thing. And so when you put a static thing next to a moving target, they don't match to me. So yeah, I just think we all try to, try to strive to just have balance in general. It's not just about work life. It's like, it's also, you know, uh, self care and taking care of yourself and just like balance just in all aspects. Um, But I also, a lot of, I mean, I don't know how, how this is for those of you who are on, but a lot of my close friends are also colleagues. They may not work in my office, but they work in the same industry, right? And so we go to dinner and we end up talking work stuff anyway. I don't know. So does that go into the life category or is that in the work category, right? Like, you know, it's because- It's an integrated category. It's an integrated <laughs> category. That's what I mean. My closest, closest friends all work in the industry. And a lot of the, a lot of them we met from being in the industry um, and, uh, and we enjoy one another. And so it also integrated for me um, that, you know, I don't know. I, but I definitely try to have balance, like in general, like I definitely try not to be all in on one thing, right? Like, you know, even when I'm like dieting phases, right? Like I'm like, I try to like have a little bit of balance and I think about. Yeah. I dangerous when you're all in. um, So so any, do you have any uh, strategies for, I mean, you've mentioned meditation, you've mentioned um, some um, hikes and things like that. Any other strategies that, and and also um, reprioritizing, you have mentioned those. Anything else that you do um, uh, for sort of, you know, to keep keep developing those um, self-awareness, self-management, self-regulation skills, or just to calm stress and give yourself some space? So the only, the other thing I'll, I'll mention is an app called Blinkist. Do you guys mm-hmm. know Blinkist? You do? Mm-hmm. Yes. Obsessed. We can send you guys so the link. For the, that, so for those of you who don't know Blinkist, um, it's an app and it's basically the, a book that's broken down into each chapter is broken down into a blink. So it's like shortened. Um, it's audible. Um, for me, it's like awesome. Like on my commute to work, which I'm back in the office now so I do commute again and um you know if I want to like read a leadership book or something but I still have the time or there's a there's a um you know if I'm going into negotiation that day I want to like freshen up on like some negotiation tactics or or skills or thoughts around negotiating or um you know we're trying to rethink a culture in our company of of hybrid right like what does it mean now to not be in the office five days a week so any of those types of things and i don't necessarily have time to read a whole book on it so i will go to my blinkist app and it's just to me like so awesome but um um i i find um that i need to sometimes break my time down into like 20, 15, 20 minute increments. 
um, and you know what can I accomplish or get done during that during that that time that is works towards my growth. Um, I mean, it, even if I get on a treadmill for 20 minutes, right, a half an hour, I'm ex I'm happy, right? Like it doesn't have. I, I try not to make it like, oh, and I have to go to the gym for an hour, right? Like it's like okay, if I you know get down on the floor and do a plank for like five yeah. minutes, I'm feeling like at least like I got like a moment I'm of like, like something, right? Yeah. Um, and so that's what really works for me is to not try to make it all into like a like like a whole thing, you know. Um, Imperfect uh, action again. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, um, but yeah, um, I run, I hike, I love, um, I love you know walks on the beach. I have a, a I have a cute little dog that you know I love to just you know spend time with, and um, and you know that those, those moments give me joy. I will go to a restaurant by myself and have a meal, like just to not have to like be around folks. And in New York, nobody thinks that's strange. You can sit in a restaurant and, mm -hmm. you know, have a meal by yourself. Um, I know a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. What about music? Do you listen to music ever just to like, well, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I can, oh, your work. Again, right? once again, it's work like integration, right? I consume a lot of music for work, but um, yeah, I mean, I love music. I mean, I part of, you know, part of the attraction for me and people, people that have known me a long time are like, oh, of course you are going to the music industry. You totally should have been there years ago. It makes total <laughs> sense because I am obsessed with music. Um, uh, and, and um, I listen to all different types of music. Um, oftentimes, uh, coworkers would say they could tell what kind of mood I was in based upon the kind of music I was playing in my office. Um, you know, whether it was like a like a slower jazz vibe or a more classical vibe or like something that was like really pounding and like you know, I just um, yeah, music gets me going or it's something that suits me. Um, I use it for all different you know all different types of ways. Um, and now I'm just exposed to you know, up and coming musical artists that I probably wouldn't have ever heard of. So that's really fun and interesting. Um, and genres of genres that I don't know that I would have gone to concerts for, mm -hmm. right? Like, I, you know, certainly listen to rock. I don't know that I had ever been to a rock, like a rock concert, which once I've gone now I'm like obsessed because it's just so entertaining and just so, um, yeah, it's just, you know, so I, I think music, listen, for a lot of people, music and the TV screens got them through COVID, right? It was, you know, mm -hmm. the combination, it was one or the other. Mm -hmm. um, it really, it, it really helped a lot of people just kind of yeah. manage their own experience yeah. or their emotions and, and, and so forth. Yeah, for sure. Um, I wanted to open it up. If anyone else has any questions, feel free to put your hand up, and I'll um, and I'll unmute you, or you can you can unmute yourself and, and ask a question. Um, but uh, otherwise, we're going to slowly wrap it up and let the fabulous Maria go, um, and we can collectively um, sort of talk more. But um, but thank you, Maria. I really my, my pleasure. I, yeah, thank you for asking me to be here. Of course, of course. And uh, I'll be in touch for sure. And thank you again for the hats, by the way. Yeah, of course. Yeah, really appreciate that too. So. Of course. Of course. <laughs> um, so we're going to well, leave with everyone. One, one final thing, Maria. So oh. if you um, had uh, uh, any message for any teacher that you grew up with, um, what would you say? If I had a message for any teacher that... Yeah, that uh, if you could re-meet any, any teacher that you grew up with. Um, well, it doesn't, it doesn't yeah. even have to be a traditional teacher. I just no, I mean, if, I mean, there's a teacher for sure, Mrs. Kirschbaum. That, that I mean, if I if I saw her right now, I mean, I just would thank her. She was um, uh, uh, so encouraging, and my 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 dad passed. As I mentioned, he was much older than my mom, and uh, so he passed. I was 14 years old, um, and you know. I don't, uh, she just had a way of like em embracing me and just like, you know, really just being there for me through that whole school year. And, and we continued to stay in touch for years after. Um, and so I think it would just give her a hug and just say, thank you. I mean, because 
um, she saw me, she heard me, like I felt that. Um, and then there's, the, and there are teachers who have, who, there, there's, you know, teachers who have been amazing to my girls. I mean, that I'm just so grateful and thankful um, for, and, and one that my, my eldest like still stays in touch with, even though, you know, it was high school years. And, and so I, seeing it through their eyes is different for me, right? Like teachers touched me, but seeing them touch my children is like on a different level, right? Like it's on a different, it's on a whole different level. Like, oh my God, you just made my, my daughter's day, right? Like by seeing her, talking to her, being there for her, listening to her when she thought no one was hearing her or seeing her. Um, uh, yeah, so there's, there's, there's a few of those too, who um, I, I should make it a point to go back and thank. Well, thank you again. That was a great note to end it on. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Maria.